Hey guys, you're listening to episode 166 of The Modern Acre, presented by Farm Together. This week, we're talking about sustainable water management and agriculture and farming with Josiah Terrell Perica, who's the director of farmland investing at Farm Together. You're listening to The Modern Acre Podcast. Every week, you'll hear from the entrepreneurs, innovators, and leaders that are changing the food and agricultural industry on and off the farm. Your hosts are Tim and Tyler Nuss. They are brothers, fifth-generation farmers, and entrepreneurs who have scaled tech startups, developed international supply chains, and built brands. The Modern Acre is ag built different. So, Tim, before we jump into this awesome episode with Josiah, I think it's time for a little parent's corner. I just feel like the need to vent a little bit. We're recording this intro on a Monday morning and, you know, starting off the week really strong. My eight-month-old daughter woke up twice last night. She usually sleeps through the night. So, um, you know, she really just wanted to to get the get mom and dad started off the week right by waking up twice. And then I was up with her at 5.40 in the morning trying to let my wife sleep after having to get up twice in the evening. And so, and then my other daughter wakes up. It was just a whole thing this morning. And then we finally get everyone organized. We get the house cleaned. Uh, we do a bath with my oldest daughter. We get our youngest down for the nap. And then my wife is getting ready to take my oldest on a walk to give me some quiet time in the house to, to get some work done. And as I'm placing my oldest into the stroller, she freaks out, screams at the highest possible decibel you can imagine, especially at, you know, 8 a.m. on a Monday, wakes my other daughter up. So, Tim, I, I joined you today just in a, a little bit all over the place because this morning has been a, a nightmare. But, you know, just an, another another morning as a father of two young daughters. Hi, that sounds like a pretty, pretty crazy morning. I like the introduction of this segment, the parenting corner. Your Monday has got, gotten off to quite a wild start. Mine's been a little bit different. My my Monday morning started with an early drop off to the vet. Whiskey's getting spayed today. So we're, we're finally making the move. She's about a year and a half. A few different schools have thought about spaying a dog. Some people do it right mm, away when us. they're a pup. And yeah. then some people prefer to wait until they go through a heat cycle or two to really let um, the dog fully develop. So we went with the latter one. And after making it through a um, the first heat, we decided that that just is not sustainable multiple times per year. So she's getting getting fixed today. Looking forward to picking her up, but it looks like a pretty pretty intense rehab, 10 to 14 days that she's going to be basically like stuck in her crate and she's a very active dog. So that'll be, that'll be interesting. Wow. 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 Super interesting. Yeah, Tim, I appreciate you sharing just the, the different schools of thoughts. I don't know if <laughs> kind of how you approached it is the equivalent of a home birth. I I, I don't know how this, <laughs> how this correlates. No offense to anyone that does home births. Uh, that's totally a personal decision, but Tim, that's <laughs> best, best, best wishes to whiskey. Yeah. She's going to be on the men. So I'll keep you posted. We'll have some status updates. I know everyone's very intently watching whiskey's Instagram, what she's up to. So mm. um, we'll keep you up. We'll keep you updated. Um, if you want to send any, any cards, flowers, um, we can definitely coordinate that as well. Yeah. I feel like I actually need cards and flowers after having, having two small daughters, but you know, whatever it's, it's not, it's not a competition, Tim. It's not a competition. I might have to send you some beer after, after your morning today, Ty. Seriously. Well, I am pumped to bring you guys this episode. Just want to say thank you guys so much for listening. We really appreciate you turning in and we we love doing this podcast, guys. Talking to really smart people every week all around food and agriculture, farmers, entrepreneurs, thought leaders. And today we're talking to Josiah Terrell Perica, who is the director of Farmland Investing at Farm Together. And so we've actually had Josiah on the show previously. And we'll we'll link that in the show notes if you haven't listened to the, the first installment already. But Josiah just knows his stuff and he knows farmland investing, has a background in the space and in finance. And today we go pretty deep on some of Farm Together's recent deals, how they're thinking about what, which deals to invest in and which not to, and what what crops are really hot right now. So I think it's I think it's really relevant information. And then we talk a lot about sustainable water management and how they're thinking, especially about 
especially with focused on California farmland, how they're thinking about wa- water and the complexities of that, how farmers are thinking about water retention and water usage. So there's a ton of nuggets in here. It, w- it was all, uh, really educational and insightful. Hey, Josiah, welcome to the show. Great to have you back. Oh, well, I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, we're excited to have you back on the show, but I guess to start off here, maybe catch us up with what you've been working on since we last had you on. Any new developments or properties you can talk to us about? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So we've expanded into uh, some new crop types, um, apples and pistachios. We, in fact, closed the largest crowdfunded ag deal recently, about a month ago. So that's very exciting. And we've been expanding our team and adding a lot of great people. No, I think let's let's jump right into that. I mean, I think the the closing the largest single asset crowd funded deal is uh, pretty pretty incredible. It was an organic apple orchard at twenty two million dollars. So let's dig into this. Tell us a little bit more about the deal. What made it unique and and high demand? Setting the stage, looking at the fundamentals. Um, apples require very specific climates. The central area of Washington is basically a high desert plateau. And, you know, it's very dry, lots of uh, sunshine, great for apples, but it also has the Columbia River. So there's tons of water as well. So this property um, was through our, our partner, Stemelt. They're a massive shipper and packer of apples. And they have a very strong, one of the largest organic um, arms in the industry. So this is a property that was owned by basically their family in a perfect area, great slope, great soils, uh, abundant water. And this was a property planted to basically the old guard of apple varieties, Red Delicious, Granny Smith. Although Granny Smith is, has been a very stable, great variety, Red Delicious, however, has been kind of going out the door. So the kind of heir apparent to the Red Delicious, you know, the industry is looking for a great, you know, red apple that um, also tastes great. Um, so we decided to do a full redevelopment. These trees were maybe in their 40s although productive, not uh, very profitable. So we developed about 200 acres, about 75% to this exciting new variety called Cosmic Crisp. So this variety has been about 20 years in the making, part uh, Honey Crisp, part Enterprise. And they really started with, uh, it's incredible what these university breeding programs do. They started with about 10,000 different, you could say strains of apples. And over the course of 20 years, they whittled it down to basically one that had all the eating characteristics, growing characteristics, uh, really suited for you know, the consumer palate and for the geography in which it's grown. So this variety is exclusive to Washington basically for the next decade and grows best there. So the fundamentals of this farm, um, absolutely excellent. Uh, Stemel is a behemoth. They're really attuned to, um, let's say sustainability, good pulse market and incredible operators as well. Um, and I'd say kind of for investors, uh, you have all these things that line up and the headline returns for this deal were absolutely phenomenal. Uh, typically, it takes you about two years to get uh, trees for a new variety. We're able to do that in about two months. And we're actually planting a year ahead of schedule. So that will provide our um, investors a nice little bump in return projections right out of the gate. So the stars aligned and everything uh, came together perfectly. Yeah, it's a super exciting deal. We talked a little bit about it on the podcast when it first came out. Um, it was kind of worlds colliding for me with my my day job with Appeal. I actually look after the Stemilt account and the relationship there. So it was kind of cool to see Farm Together do the deal with Stemilt. But everything you hit on, I think, is super critical, like the, the variety mix of planting Cosmic Crisp and Sweet Tango, which is Stemilt's proprietary variety. I think that speaks to the consumer demand for club apples and the growth there and kind of getting away from the their traditional varieties, and then just the alignment with a top tier marketer that has really good presence domestically and export. I think that's going to bode well for the investment. Um, absolutely. And I, I guess uh, an add on, I'm glad you mentioned the appeal uh, science piece of it. So Stemelt is one of the, uh, an exclusive kind of partner there. I think they're one of maybe three processors utilizing the appeal technology. They apply basically organic secondary skin to extend the sh- shelf life of multiple, you know, fresh produce items, apples, avocados, things like that, and um, an effort to reduce food waste. So that's another nice environmental sustainability component that further just makes this a, an excellent deal all around. 
absolutely. It's been super fun getting that up and running with Stemilt this season. Overall, it's looking super, super positive and great to see the, the retailer adoption and consumer feedback as well. Well, well, we'll jump ahead a little bit here, Josiah, and wanted to dig into some recent news. California recently announced that they would be facing another drought for just four years after the historic 2011 to 2016 drought. Naturally, this casts greater concerns about water usage as it pertains to agriculture and farming. What can you tell us about what you've been seeing as the main concerns regarding water management and conservation in ag? So I, I'd say before I address that directly, California always oscillates between super wet years and super dry years. So this kind of plays into um, kind of how the, the state you know, sets up their infrastructure, things like that. But I, I'd say the first thing is you know, with management. Um, so you have, let's say, management of just the precipitation that falls in that state. So you have about 42 million acre feet or so of uh, surface water storage. And that basically, basically covers you for a four year period. So with the last drought, we saw reservoirs dip to historic lows, things like that. And California is nowhere near that point just yet. But I guess the concerns are really around um, ag in general. Um, trees require a lot of water. Um, and it's not that trees require water. It's well, we're using those trees. We're eating um, those fruits and nuts and vegetables and so on. Um, so, you know, my, my thinking is more so kind of what, what is the highest and best use of these water resources? So if something can be grown outside, outside of California, it makes sense for those crops to migrate since the, the climate of California is so specialized um, for, let's say, crops like pistachios, walnuts, and almonds that produce um, significant economic value you know, per unit of water used. I think that's something I see happening, but there's some uh, market inefficiencies in place. Um, some are straddled by, let's say, environmental or just um, outdated um, laws that don't allow the highest and best uses of those water resources to migrate to the appropriate place. So, you know, you do have those competing interests. It's like you have ag versus environmental. And of course, we should take care of the environment. Uh, but I think at uh, the same time, we need to also place a cost on these decisions. Um, for example, the way California developed uh, you have dams all along the Sierra Nevada. I think California has over 1,400 dams. So the landscape in California has been irreversibly changed to account for the specific climate type, but also to cater to some of the most productive farmland on the planet. So I think it's very critical to, uh, to look at, you know, kind of what are those other externalities if you're trying to move ag out of the state, since one, you know, we need food and California is the best place to grow it and the most probably environmentally sustainable place to grow it. Because that same acre in California being moved somewhere else, you know, you might have to, you know, take an acre and a half or two acres to get to that same output level. No, that's a really good way of putting it. I mean, it's something that we think a lot about, obviously, as California farmers, but I really, really appreciate how you laid that out with some of the challenges and some of the, the root causes. So want to dig into this a little bit more, Josiah. Um, I think some something that uh, many might not be aware of is that California is only one of five Mediterranean climate regions in the world, and certain crops actually thrive and rely on this type of climate. So tell us a little bit more about what makes California unique in this respect and what types of crops are known to rely on the combination of weather conditions present along the West Coast. Um, sure. And I, I guess I'm nerd out for a quick second, you know, around the Mediterranean climate, California specifically, and the, the crops that are best suited for that. So uh, a Mediterranean climate uh, captures a very small swath of ag land in the world suitable for, for production. So these places are found between 30 and 40 degrees latitude in the northern and southern hemisphere. And they're on the western faces of continents. And they usually have very um, irregular topography, which plays into some other pieces I'll speak to later. So the, let's say you're looking at California, um, western face of a continent right in that latitude band. And the reason why it needs to be close to the ocean is because you have these semi-permanent pressure systems, you know, down south near, let's say the Hawaiian Islands, you have the Pacific High. Uh, as you go up north towards Alaska, you have the Aleutian Low. And kind of the interplay of those two systems uh, plays a lot into what happens with the precipitation in California. So in the summertime, um, that Pacific high moves north. And what it does is it blocks storm tracks that would normally come to California. So a Mediterranean climate is defined as being basically dry and warm in the summer. So you, you basically every year you have, you know, kind of an eighth month 
eight month drought um, because of the way those semi permanent pressure cells interplay. Uh, which means, you know, let's say in the the winter time, you get a lot of rain and precipitation over a couple of months, and that's because as the Pacific High recedes, uh, all these atmospheric river events, which are basically these um, enhanced vapor uh, trails that kind of move from kind of the South Pacific across, you know, the U.S., um, and about half of California's precipitation comes from these storm events. So in an average year, now California never really has an average year, it's either really um, dry or really wet. But in let's say we suppose a, an average year, you might get you know, three to five storms. Now having you know, a couple more storms or a couple fewer storms can be the defining you know, factor in having a dry or a wet year. And that's something we saw during the last drought, which was that you had something they call, I think a, a triple R, a ridiculously resilient ridge. You had this high pressure system that was just sitting, sitting off the coast of California and was really hard to break. Um, and the other piece is you kind of had the co-occurrence of really dry conditions because of that, uh, but also record temperatures. And that interplay was kind of a disaster to deal with. Um, now, the thing is kind of, I guess, circling back to kind of the storm tracks. Uh, when those storms go across California, uh, California is a very interesting, um, has a very interesting geography and geology. So when you think about production in California, it's really the Central Valley, which is basically this giant sediment filled valley, uh, maybe a hundred plus million years ago, it used to actually be kind of divided in half. And over time, those two parts of the valley, the Coast Range and the Sierra Nevadas merged together to create a valley. Um, so the Central Valley is basically surrounded by, I don't know if it's like a thousand miles plus of just giant mountains. So what that means is as storms come over California, um, you know, you have different things, you know, with like rain shadows and um, orographic precipitation. So, for example, orographic precipitation has to do with the deposition of precipitation um, on, I, I forget, windward, leeward um, orientation. But basically, as air masses move over mountains, they reach points of supersaturation, uh, which causes that precipitation to form, to, you know, water to condense. And that's where the Sierra Nevada mountain range comes into play. And a lot of, let's say about a third of the state's water supply is stored as snow. Um, now I mentioned that, you know, you have about 1400 dams in California. Now that's mostly along the Sierra Nevada range because one, you have uh, mountain ranges that go up to about maybe 14,000 feet. And then over a couple miles drop to the valley floor, which is close to sea level. So the Hydroelectric potential is enormous. Um, and also, you know, those uh, mountains feed, you know, streams and rivers throughout the year. Um, that's why, like in California, like the April 1st snowpack is so important because that's kind of the peak of snowpack, you know, for the year. And over the summer months, you know, it, it melts and it feeds a lot of rivers and streams. So that's, you know, that's why, you know, it's very important to have the infrastructure in place to capture this because California and all Mediterranean climates have a temporal and a spatial um, disparity in, in water. So when the water falls is a very short time of year, so you need to capture as much as possible. And where it falls in California, about 75% of that water falls in maybe the northern quarter or third of the state, north of Sacramento. So you have all the water falling up north, but all the demand is coming from down south. So you need to have giant surface water storage programs, but you also need to have extensive conveyance systems in place to move water around the state. That's why California has some of the best uh, and most extensive irrigation projects in the world. And when you get to the valley floor um, this, of the Central Valley, which spans from you know, the tip where you know, Bakersfield is in the South, all the way up to you know, close to Redding, um, Shasta Dam, um, that's about 400 miles. And if you kind of look at you know, what is kind of farmable from Coast Range to the Sierra Nevada Range, it's about 50 miles. So it's about 13 million acres of farmable land, let's say maybe half of that's actually irrigated. So with California, since you know, you're surrounded by all these mountains over time, erosion, all that um, eroded you know, parent material from those mountains uh, goes down to the, the valley floor. So you have some of the largest chunks of class one, highly fertile farmland in the world. So in California, most of the Central Valley has excellent fundamentals for farming. So 
then you come to this mismatch. You have more soil and climate than you have water to support it sustainably. That's, that's, that's something that kind of gets more into kind of the conservation questions that were asked before. So, you know, it's all about, you know, what is the highest and best use, make, making sure you use those crops effectively. But in California, you can grow really anything. There's about 400 different commodities you can grow. And the ones specific to Mediterranean climates that can't really grow anywhere else. You know, California has a monopoly on, um, not just in the U.S., but kind of internationally as well. We grow most of the, the almonds. Uh, we export most of the, the walnuts. You know, we're now one of the biggest, you know, pistachio producers and exporters in the world. And there's a long list of other things as well where California is perfectly suited uh, to grow these things. Um, you know, things like corn and soy and things like that might grow well in California, but there's other places where it can grow just as well or close to. Well, wow, thanks for that super thorough explanation. I definitely learned a ton having you walk us through that. I wanted to kind of dig in a bit on almonds. You mentioned that as a crop and wanted to kind of get your take on how that translates, obviously, with the concern for water in this current year and becoming a trend in California. Um, we have seen a big shift of growers planting permanent crops and planting almonds, and you can see kind of a lot of investment happening in the space where it's a permanent crop with kind of stable returns where you can forecast out, you know, 10, 20 years for an orchard, but also kind of a lot of bad press. You see one almond takes a gallon worth of water and a bunch of stuff that comes out about water usage on permanent crops and almonds, especially. Maybe talk to us about your take on, on that aspect. Um, absolutely. So, uh, with let's say ag in California, water usage peaked maybe 20 years ago, um, and as you know, the cost of water increases, um, it incentivizes people to make better use of that. So if let's say 20 years ago, as a form of rodenticide or pest control, um, I flood irrigate my farm, and I you know that's you know economical at that time to do so. But as that cost increases, not just because of surface water costs, but let's say you know. Drilling a well is expensive. Pumping water from a thousand feet is expensive. So you want to stretch that, you know, crop per drop. And uh, one of the easiest ways to do so is to use drip irrigation. That's a kind of a double-edged sword in the sense that, you know, it targets the root system of the tree. You don't want that water passing the root system um, if you're trying to optimize, let's say, your usage of water for that crop. Um, the other piece is that if you're not going past the root zone, you're not really recharging those aquifers. And I guess that's maybe a, a separate discussion. More farmers are one, you know, I think the almond industry has a disproportionately higher share of drip irrigation and more efficient irrigation methods in place. Um, and two, you know, utilizing technology. Um, so for, let's say you look at an almond tree, you know, what is that water used for? It's basically um, to cool the tree, you know, vapor tr vapotranspiration. Um, 95% of the water the tree takes up just gets evaporated to keep it cool. Now, those water requirements, um, they, they move with the temperature and uh, just other, other factors in the environment. So knowing exactly what your tree needs, when it needs it, so you don't apply too little and too much, leads to those efficiency gains. Um, and the almond industry in the last, I believe, two decades has reduced the water usage per acre by I think about a third. And over the next four to five years, you know, there's the industry is committed to reducing water usage or increasing efficiency by another 20%. Now, the thing is, you know, I've speak, spoken to, you know, a little bit to the, you know, highest and best use economic value of almonds. You know, they're healthy. They produce a lot of money. Um, so they can pay for, um, they can basically pay for themselves. But the other piece is you're not just growing an, al you know, an almond, you know, because when we think of almond trees, we think of the kernel. But that's only one thing you're growing. You also have the hole and you have the shells, which have, you know, they can be um, supplied to livestock as feed. I heard of this one program called torification. I hope I'm saying that correctly, where you can convert it into bioplastics, things like that. So there's um, more to an almond tree than just the almond. And, you know, it's not that a, a gallon is needed to grow um, one almond or whatever that statistic is. It's like you're growing a tree as well. And that tree is also taking carbon dioxide out of the, the atmosphere and providing habitats and other things like that. So there's other pieces of the production equation that need to be discussed as well. Yeah, I think I think super important to have a nuanced conversation about it, right? And I think like ultimately 
there, there's, there's all these things that are talked about within the, the food industry, right, about climate change and, and water use. And, and sometimes I think we get lost a little bit in some of these headlines. I mean, we can talk about climate change where maybe it's being grown by a regenerative farmer, but that regenerative farmer is in South America and we have to transport it up to North America or Europe and all of the carbon use uh, through the logistics, right? That's just like another example about how I think there's a bit of nuance in, in these conversations. So thanks for walking us through that. Wanted to dig in a little bit more about water use and what you're learning as you talk to farmers and engage with farmers about what they're doing to to mitigate water use and practice sustainable water management. You, you mentioned drip, of course. Anything else that you're learning? Uh, yeah, so uh, I guess uh, I guess a couple of things. You know, there's the um, you know what kind of irrigation system you have set up, what kind of technology you have in place to monitor the water demands of those crops, um, and also looking for for ways to you could say recharge um, those aquifers as another kind of sustainable water management practice. So I mentioned that you know California has X amount of dams. Now the last dam that was constructed of meaningful size. Uh, was maybe over 20, or maybe I think more than that, maybe 40 years ago in the 1980s or so. So I don't think uh, from an environmental standpoint or a cost standpoint, um, you can reach sustainability by building more dams. Where you're going to see a lot of the growth happening um, in water management is the creation of more recharge programs um, and just uh, ponding basins to sink more water into the ground during wet years. Because uh, California is always oscillating between wet and dry. And when you have extremely wet years, uh, that's when we need to take advantage of those, you know, that hydrology to maybe make up for the years that have been drier and make sure those aquifers always have enough water in them. So that California is in production, you know, 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now, and you're not inhibiting an intergenerational resource. Totally. That makes, makes a ton of sense. Josiah, just one one more question as we kind of wrap up this this water conversation. When you look at evaluating a property, when you're looking at water rights, what are you what are you looking for as far as water sources and quality and the the strength of the water right that the the landowner holds? So the equation you're, you're trying to balance is what is this crop demand? It's like okay, what are you growing? What are the density is what kind of soils do I have? If they're really so, uh, sandy. Uh, that water infiltration is a little bit higher. If you have more clay-like soils, uh, that water holding capacity might be higher. So you need less water maybe on heavier soils, but they not, might not be as suitable for a range of crops. On the supply side, it's like, where does your water come from? So Sigma really focuses on um, groundwater sustainability, although there's a surface water component. Um, but it's like, okay, what is my sustainable yield? Long-term, what can I pump from this aquifer? Two is... What is my, what does the crop need versus what do I need to apply to it? So what that, that nuance is, um, if you're in an area that has a lower you know, evapotranspiration rate, or there's a lot more, let's say, precipitation, uh, what that means is that you might have to apply less water because, you know, a greater proportion of that demand is satiated by, by rainfall. So it's like, what is my effective precipitation? And the other piece is, what are my surface water supplies? Um, in the South Valley, south of Sacramento, that is um, a much uh, bigger concern is, you know, having that dual source water. So when you kind of stack up those three pieces, then you kind of get to see how, um, how that equation is tilted. So in California, you have to be much more judicious with uh, how you evaluate water. And it's really through the prism of, of Sigma. Um, so Sigma is, Sigma is the law. I guess that's the simple way to put it. Um, there are about 515 uh, sub-basins. So those are basically um, areas that have aquifers underlying, kind of uh, divvied up based on geological or political lines. So like if you're a water district, the sub-basin might be tweaked to better match your boundaries so you can uh, better manage um, that area since you already have um, some management authority already. So when we're looking at farms, you know, I, I look at that equation and then it's like, okay, we need to look at this more intensely through um, a groundwater perspective. So Sigma mandates that basically all, all sub-basins with, you know, medium high priority designations need to be sustainable by 2040. And there's different mechanisms in place to achieve this. Um, you can, you know, reduce demand, increase supply and a whole bunch of other things. 
Now, the way Sigma defines sustainability is really what I focus on. Um, and there are six undesirable impacts or results that need to be avoided. And, you know, it can't be um, unreasonable, you know, let's say declines in this or that. Um, so uh, let's see if I can remember off the top of my head. So, you know, you have groundwater quality. So as, let's say, an aquifer, uh, uh, you know, the groundwater elevation drops. In some cases, that water quality can change. It can degrade. Um, so that's, that's one piece. Saltwater intrusion. This is more so on the coast. Um, as let's say that freshwater uh, underground reservoirs, aquifers drop, um, that can be replaced by seawater or encourage the intrusion of seawater into those aquifers. Um, so that's that's something that's only really an issue on the coast. Um, next is kind of the uh, chronic lowering of groundwater levels. So that's something you can kind of look at a hydrograph and you know get a sense of. The other piece, a little bit more interesting, um, is uh, subsidence which plays also into the other variable, which is um, reduction in groundwater capacity. So subsidence is basically as, you know, what's removed beneath the surface, that water volume, uh, if it's not replaced, that land starts to drop. And this is more so an issue or is amplified around key infrastructure. So let's say the uh, California aqueduct, Frank Kern Canal, roads, things like that. Um, it can cause damage. Um, as the ground moves and shifts and infrastructure is damaged there. Now, it's interesting when you talk about lowering of groundwater, let's say capacity, you know, reducing capacity of aquifers, that's largely driven by what kind of strata you have. So I mentioned how, let's say, sandy soils, you know, water um, moves through it much more quickly with clay, not as quickly, but it holds more water. Um, now, you have inelastic and elastic um, aquifers. Um, or you could say soil stratus. So what that means is like, if you imagine you have a you know, Home Depot five gallon bucket and you fill one with ping pong balls and the other one with Play-Doh, you know, that's kind of like ping pong balls in shape. As I fill up one, one bucket with water, you know, it expands, or, you know, take the water out, it contracts, but there's always that porosity space between those individual, you know, pieces of, of particles, sand, whatever it might be. Now with Play-Doh, as you compress it, um, it basically loses its capacity almost forever, almost becomes like concrete. So those kind of aquifers are inelastic. So you can try to recharge them, but they won't really rebound. If you have a very sandy area and let's say there is some, some subsidence, you can add water back and those elastic aquifers um, can recover. So those are, those are things that are very important to understand is, you know, where, what is the geology or the geological or hydrological reality of the area I'm in. If I'm closer to the coast range to the west, you know, maybe more in a rain shadow, I might get less precipitation. So my applied water, my ET might be higher. Um, so this is all kind of the, the calculus that goes into, um, am I doing this correctly? Or am I um, taking into account all the factors? And I believe the last point um, of those six uh, undesirable impacts is kind of groundwater, surface water interconnection. So recharge comes from multiple places, uh, but particularly precipitation and stream flow. So if a groundwater table is dropping below a, a river, that net can flow from the river to the, um, there's a net inflow, or I guess movement of water from the river to the, to the aquifer. And that's something they're trying to avoid. You know, you don't want streams disappearing because it's all going to subsurface flows. Now, when water tables are high, um, water can actually um, move to the river and increase stream flow. So these are kind of the different points that are being considered and talked about in you know, kind of those rooms where th these policies by the districts, joint powers associations um, or agreements, that's, that's kind of how they're looking at sustainability. Of course, there's a lot more nuance and I could probably spend another hour trying to peel those layers back, but that's how I think about it in a nutshell. No, that's super, super helpful and really insightful to walk through those different aspects uh, of what goes into your thinking. And I know Tim really needed an education in subsidence. So I think that was really, really helpful for him as well. But um, this has been a, a ton of fun, Josiah, really informative. Um, really appreciate you sharing all this all this detail. As, as we finish up here, how are you thinking about the the rest of the year? What what stuff do you have down the pipeline that you can share? What, what's going to be your primary focus? So my, my primary focus uh, for the rest of the year is really trying to 
supply enough farms for um, the um, skyrocketing demand that we've been seeing. And the biggest issue is really trying to find high quality stuff. So you have, you know, in California, for example, you have 100 million acres, maybe about a quarter of that, you know, used for cropland, and maybe only 12% of the total is actually being used for, you know, things you might be interested in. So there's a very, very small sliver of the market that we're we're looking to buy into. And, you know, you have a lot of a lot of money on the sidelines. Ag is becoming um, increasingly more attractive to retail investors. You know, that's kind of what we're targeting, but also institutional clients. There's a big mandate to deploy capital and ag. So the jiu-jitsu is really finding something that's attractively priced with the right fundamentals um, that kind of fits the buy box we've established for our client base. So we look to um, expand into uh, more regions, really increase our footprint, in places like Oregon and Washington, Northern California, um, and continue to bring you know solid deals with uh, excellent fundamentals and attractive returns for our investors. Awesome. We're, we're super, super excited that we're connected with you guys. Looking forward to the upcoming deals that you have in the pipeline. And I'm sure we'll be talking again soon. Thanks for being with us, Josiah. I yeah, really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. So, Tim, what'd you think? Oh, that was a super fun episode. Love catching up with Josiah, seeing what they're up to. Love getting into those deals, but like really, really fun talking about water and just getting like the really thorough walkthrough there about how they're looking at that. Like we, we both have invested in real estate before of looking at what different aspects of the home you're looking at and water is like the kind of very similar when you're looking at ag real estate and how the water use is, is being managed and reported against and how you're in compliance with Sigma, especially in California. So I thought that was super interesting and becoming just critical criteria for them as they look at future deals, just making sure it has access to water and sustainable water. No, super good point. I think, uh, yeah, I, I learned a ton. I was eating it up because, you know, we've talked about this a lot about our, our farm and how we've thought about water rights and water management. It's all it's all super relevant and hope you guys um, enjoyed that episode. I think it was, it was fun going deep on their Apple deal as well. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. We really appreciate it. Be sure to follow Whiskey on Instagram. We'll link that in the show notes. And, you know, for all the par- parents out there, keep on keeping on. You know, it, it's it's a marathon, not a sprint. Well said, Ty. We'll hope you guys had an awesome Easter weekend and are off to a good start for your weeks. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.